just want to say good morning and good afternoon to all the attendees and a special warm welcome to our New York chapter um, members. Um, today, we're having the seventh edition of our leadership series, The Eight Steps to Developing People. In 2021, the chapter board voted to invest in the development of leaders, an area where the chapter had little presence before. We partnered with Lions Pride Leadership, whose mission and purpose is to awaken, empower, and equip leaders to reach their full potential, a goal shared by the chapter board. We worked with the Lions Pride founder, Chad Reyes, who is a mentee at John Maxwell, the world-renowned leader who's written over 21 books and presented around the world on leadership. Um, the chapter has invited several leaders in the industry to share their experiences on the topics included in the eight steps to um, developing people in this leadership series. The program has earned the chapter, the 2022 Innovation Award from Global. So I was like, yay, chapter, right? That's a wonderful thing. Um, today, uh -huh. we have held six sessions on the eight steps to developing people. The first leader we, we presented was Jim Ambrosini, and he talked about you are here. It's a, exactly that, understanding where you are in your leadership journey. Nigel James, who talked about identity. Chad Reyes, who talked about awareness and giftedness, which talks about what you really, what, what you can present and what you can use to develop your leadership skills. Also, we had Fareed Aldercator, who is our chapter president, who also talked about character and who you are and what, you, what authenticity you bring to, to the leadership role. We also talked to Ken Draker, who is who presented on style. So for this month, Women's History Month, we wanted to highlight an amazing female leader in the industry. And so we have Barbie Goldstein, who is part of Protivity, and she's going to be talking to us about the journey, right? Um, before I turn it over to Barbie, I will like to bring Chad Reyes on to give us more information about journey. Chad? Hey, team. Tina, can you hear me? And can you see me? All right. Well, I am I'm so happy to be with everyone today. You know, I le leadership to me is the most important thing because I, I love when John Maxwell says this. He says that everything rises and falls on leadership. And I, I'm a big believer of that. I, I've seen in my organization uh, years ago when I was not an effective leader, there was a lid on what was possible. And as my wife and I and our teams developed and grew as leaders, uh, everything became possible. And the things we're doing today is just amazing. But it's 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 because we grew as a leader. And today, I, I'm so excited to share with you uh, the, the step of journey. Uh, so I, I'm going to share my screen in a moment. But being a leader is is so key. And all of us are a leader because this is how I define leadership. If we influence a person, whether it's one or it's 100 million people, if we're influencing one or 100 million people, then we're a leader because leadership is influence, nothing more, nothing less. So today we're going to jump into talking about the journey and you're going to hear an amazing story from Barbie. She's going to share about her journey of her leadership journey. So I'm going to I'm going to share my screen right now and we're going to get started. So let me uh, let me share that. Could you guys see my screen? All right, there we go. So we're- Chad, we see a desktop. As we, it's, it's, uh, could you okay, see my- go. It's now, now we see Okay, everybody. great. Thank you. You know, when, when, when we talk about leadership and we talk about business, we, we, we look at it through, we call it our master operating system. These are the eight areas every organization needs to focus on. And we, and we don't have finances on there because I'm a big believer that finances is always a byproduct. So today, what we're going to be talking about is specifically the people area of the master operating system. And this is, I, I believe that 70 to 75% of the success of any organization, uh, any, any not-for-profit, uh, any family is on how well they lead. And, and today, I want to specifically be talking about, you guys, have, as we've went through this series, we've gone through many of these. Today, we're going we're gonna to jump over seven. We're going to go to eight today. And we're going to talk about journey. 
the journey of leadership. And I, and I want to just, I want to leave you with some insights because I know that whatever I'm going to share, Barbie is going to take it to a whole nother level and, and really share her journey of leadership and the impact it's had on her. And I'm certainly sure it'll have it on you as well. So today I want to point out the first part of the journey is that it takes two things. It's competency and consistency. You see, when you're on the journey, we got to be competent and we got to be consistent. So what does that look like when it comes to leadership? So I want I want to talk to you about competency. You see there there are there are four phases to this whole area of competency and it's being a novice, an apprentice, or journeyman and a master. That is the overall encompassing aspect of the journey of leadership. And I want to just point to you a little bit on each one of them, because you may be in that area. You may be in the journey, in the novice phase, uh, and then you may be in the apprentice uh, phase. And, and I'll walk you through each one of them, because I know that Barbie's been there, I've been there, and every single leader that we've had on the panel over the years have started as a novice. And a novice is typically someone who who's just starting, and they, they, they don't really have a tremendous amount of knowledge because they're just new. They're new in whatever position you put them in. Now, that may be you. And that's a, that's a scary spot to be in because you're just starting. But the, the good thing about a novice is you're not expected to know everything. What you are expected is to learn and develop yourself. And the great thing about being a novice is that you, you, you don't have huge responsibilities yet. However, there will be a day when you go to a, being an apprentice and then a journeyman and a master that they'll require you to have a super high level of responsibility. And one of the things when we're in the novice phase, now hear me out on this because it's an important one. When you're in the novice phase, if you are a leader that has people on your team that are in that novice phase, you want to be careful because it's such an impressionable phase of leadership because you want to be around people who care for you and care for the development of you. But then you go from being a novice, just knowing something, just starting out, and you move to an apprentice where you could do some stuff on your own, but you really need your leader around you because you, you haven't mastered the skill set yet and the competency yet. And then you go to uh, a, a journeyman. And a journeyman is a real simple process. A journeyman can do a lot of things really well. They've been at it for a while now in their craft. They've been developing themselves. They're able to do 80 or 90% of the tasks that are put on their desk without necessarily needing help from others. But the thing about a journeyman is this, is that if you, if you as a leader, if you stay in the journeyman phase, what happens is you get complacent. Because there's really so much more when you move to that next phase, which is master. And the thing I love about master is this, is that as a master in any craft, whether it be cybersecurity, IT, risk audit, it doesn't matter whether it be in leadership development or whether it be in the insurance world. It don't matter the industry. As you go from being a journeyman to being a master, now you get to invest in others. You get to develop others. You get to multiply. And, I, and, I, and I'll share with you this. I've, I've been in business now for 20 years. And I am not ha I, I, I've never had as much fun as I am in these last few years because I'm moving now into mentoring so many leaders that are being able to develop and grow and impact organizations, whether it's in our own company or in many of the companies that we mentor and, and coach and, and teach or, you know, throughout the country. So... Moving from journeyman to master increases competency, but it also, and listen to this, it also makes you more valuable. You see, I, as a leader, when I, when I go into an organization and they're telling me, well, Chad, I want to grow the organization. I want to, I want to be able to reach more people. I want to be able to get more clients. I want to be able to take over more market share. I just say to them, do you have enough leaders to allow yourself to accomplish that? You see, most organizations have only followers. Great people can develop more leaders. And in the journey of leadership, getting to master is really important because you can master your craft. But this is the key. In mastery, 
you also get to mentor and develop and multiply more leaders. And that is, to me, it's one of my greatest joys right now because I'm growing and as I'm developing and my wife and I and our organizations are growing, I'm getting to develop more leaders, just like you on the call today. This is the journey of leadership. So the first part of it is competency, and Barbie's going to be talking more about that. The second part of it is here. It's knowing that leadership is literally like walking up steps. And the first part of leadership is you can't lead others if you can't lead yourself well. As a leader, personal leadership is so key, especially when you're on a journey of becoming a master in your, in your craft and then developing more people. I, I, I'm a big believer that I will not put a person in a position of leadership if they can't lead themselves well. Because if they can't lead themselves well, then they're not going to be able to lead others well. Which leads me to the second part then, is when you lead yourself well, and you're consistent now, right? Remember, the first one was competency. The second one is consistency. So you lead yourself well, you're consistent. Now you've earned the opportunity to now mentor another person on a one-on-one -on -one leadership level. Now, now, once you've done that well, and you've been consistent, well, then you've earned the opportunity to lead at a team leadership level where you get to lead 5, 7, 10, 15, 20 people on your team and develop a team. And the amazing thing about this is if you've done that well and you've been consistent, you've earned the opportunity to lead at an organizational leadership level. And, and, and no matter where you are on your leadership journey, I just want to encourage you that if you take steps and you build your competency, and you build your consistency, what will happen is this. You'll have competency plus consistency. And when you have competency and consistency, you, you get opportunities. All of a sudden, doors start opening. All of a sudden, you get promoted. They give you more influence. And, and, and that's been the journey of, of Barbie Goldstein, as she's going to share with you her journey today. She, she's developed competency in an area. She's been very consistent for many years. And it's given her tremendous opportunity for her to grow in her, you know, grow in her organization and grow uh, and, and, and be a leader of leaders. So I just what, what I want to do is I want to hand, hand it over right now to Farid Abdel Qaeda. He's going to introduce our amazing speaker, Barbie Goldstein. And I'm just excited to hear what she has to say. I'm going to be a student and just sit down and take it all in. So with that, Farid, I want to hand it over to you. And, and we want to welcome Barbie to join us today. Now, I appreciate that, uh, Chad. Just a, a quick blip here as I know we're running a little over. Uh, I had the pleasure of working with Barbie ever since I joined Productivity back in 2005. She was an, an up-and-comer. Uh, she was, I believe, a, a manager, a senior manager at the time, and she's one of the most trailblazing figures in the organization. In fact, I think she's one of the youngest managing directors in the organization, certainly one of the youngest to ever take the global innovation role a few years back. Uh, she did so well and has influenced so many folks within Productivity, which is one of the larger global consulting firms, that she got into a position to lead global accounts. If you can only imagine the pressure something like that introduces, when you join an organization like the uh, NYPD or the fire department or something like this, when someone graduates or gets promoted to a new role, they don't put you in the same precinct. And there's a reason for that. They feel that people see you in a certain way and they won't respect the role that you're stepping into. Barbie was able to have all the folks that she's worked with ever since she was a consultant level resource, someone right out of college, and go all the way to the managing director levels, dealing with CEOs, CAEs, CROs around the world, some of the largest organizations in banking you could possibly imagine, all the way to some of the largest retail uh, organizations that you could imagine and have the uh, best conversations, innovate the organizations and get to a point where they've sustained the relationship and have built themselves, built the, uh, their consulting services in these areas larger than they ever have instead of slowing things down. She's been a huge influence on me, as you can tell. And I've learned a lot. A lot of the characteristics in, in the training I provided, a lot of that came from Barbie. A lot of the, some of the things that may seem even simple to some really echo uh, quite a bit as you get in the higher levels of management. So without that, uh, and, and appreciating the opportunity to have you on Barbie, uh, Barbie Goldstein. Thanks very much, Fareed. 
I'm going to try to share my screen here for everybody. And nice to be chatting with everybody um, today. So thanks very much for having me uh, and for the great introductions. Everybody's uh, making my ego explode so far. So uh, hopefully I can keep it under control. But um, so, you know, as, as Chad and Freed mentioned, I'll be talking a bit about my journey today, um, and which has been interesting and um, I guess one thing I definitely want to say is, you know, everyone's journey is unique. Um, so we, we all kind of go through our own paths to get where we're going from a leadership perspective. Uh, one thing that I've definitely learned too is you don't want to try to overplan that too much because you might miss opportunities that are available to you. So while we're purposeful about our development, we also need to be open. Uh, and so what I thought might be helpful today is, um, and Fried always likes the reference to potholes, so we, we're keeping those in here. Um, cause those happen along the journey, um, is really kind of the things that, you know, when I look back on my journey to where I am today, you know, what are some of the behaviors or traits that I embraced that I really feel like helped me develop as a leader. Uh, and so hopefully, you know, th this is again, my own, but I think some of these things are pretty, um, helpful for everyone in terms of the way we kind of think about how we kind of operate or, um, receive situations. So figured I would share those with you all today and give you some examples of those as well. Um, so the first one um, is really about taking risks. Um, so I started my career at Arthur Anderson. Uh, I was in technology audit. Um, and within just, it feels like a hot minute, that was all over and, and Protivity started. Um, and I've been at Protivity since, since inception here. And so I spent probably the first I don't know, dozen years of my career really in the technology audit space, knew it, loved it, uh, and so on. And I was comfortable there. Um, and at one point in my career, and I think as Chad alluded to too, you know, if you can kind of behave consistently and kind of create quality and people know they can rely on you uh, to be doing the right stuff, knowing what you're doing, et cetera, you know, different opportunities come your way. Um, and so, you know, at one point in my career, I don't know if it was like almost 10 years ago now, um, I had the opportunity to take on a project. And sometimes these things will come to you definitely because you you kind of earn that consistent reputation. You know, the other half of it is, you know, there's just a situation that arises and somebody decides that you are the kind of person they can look to, right? Uh, but it wasn't necessarily, again, something that's pre-planned. And so that's why it's, it's good not to kind of totally attach yourself to a very specific path. Uh, but I had the opportunity to start working more outside of the technology space in audit and in an environment where there was heavy regulatory scrutiny um, and where I would have heavy interaction directly with regulators, which is not something I was experienced with before. Um, and kind of in a, I'll call it a high uh, pressure or high stress environment. And, you know, when I was asked to kind of take on that role, of course, the first you know thing you think about is, I, I'm not sure that I can do that. Um, and, you know, those things will come across you in your career. Um, and you, you really need to think about, okay, is this the right opportunity for me? And is this a risk I should take? And just, you know, kind of the epitome of that example for me too, Fareed mentioned that I was the global innovation leader at Productivity for a few years. Um, I remember receiving a phone call from our leadership asking me if I want to interview for this global innovation leader role. Um, and I'll tell you that when I, when I got that call, I, you know, the only thing I could think about was I have no idea why anybody would be considering me for this. This is not my area. You know, I don't know what I would need to be doing. I'm not highly technical with, you know, things like blockchain. There was a hundred things going through my head about, you know, why this didn't make any sense in terms of me understanding this. Um, but I said, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm happy to interview for this role internally. Um, and I was competing with a, a number of other folks, uh, another number of other managing directors and went through this series of like five interviews, all the while kind of presenting myself as positively as I could, but still with these reservations in the back of my head, although I definitely was super interested in this space. And so that was something that definitely drove me, but I was just questioning myself. Um, and then one day, um, you know, the leader called me into his office, you know, several months later, and he said, you know, we'd like you to take this role. And I was like, you know, of course I, I accepted it and I was excited, but as soon as I walked out of that office, I was in complete panic mode. Because now reality was here and this was mine. And I really, in my mind, I didn't have the first clue what I needed to do. Um, and it took me several days to kind of, I was contemplating that a lot and it was a little bit on the stressful side. 
Um, but one thing that came to me eventually related to this, because I, what I was working through in my head was, again, this makes no sense, you know, which led to, well, why, why would my leadership ask me to do this, right? And, you know, well, one answer is they have no clue what they're doing, but I really then quickly concluded, I don't think that's the case um, because they're leading, leading my institution and that's not what I think. So if, if they know what they're doing, right? I finally concluded and it was like a little bit of an epiphany. Maybe they can see something in me that I can't see yet. And so if they have the faith to, to kind of put me in this position, I should have the confidence to take this on, right? Because maybe they're the ones that, that can see more than I can see at this time. And that kind of helped me a little bit get uh, past some of the nerves and, and some of the uncertainty. And it was a big learning curve. Um, that I needed to go through for this for sure, uh, but super developmental. And I'll talk about that a little bit too. So I would just say, you know, you obviously have to, you know, things will come across your way if you are kind of, you know, doing a great job and, and being consistent and being a leader and exhibiting the right traits and capabilities. And for each one of those, you have to evaluate, you know, if it's right for you, but try not to let fear be, be the barrier, right? Um, you really have to be brave and kind of be uncomfortable and be okay with that because you'll, you know, if it's the right thing, you will figure it out. And, and you know, I think I did. And I think my institution thinks I did over time. And um, those things really help you. So um, one is really just thinking about how you take risks properly and, and be brave and take on things that make you uncomfortable. So the second behavior um, is innovate. And I, this is one of my favorite innovation quotes by Henry Ford. He said, if I asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses because you know they weren't contemplating an automobile at that time. Um, and it's just interesting to think about you know, what's possible. Um, the role that I was just talking about really helped develop my mindset differently and made me think differently because I had always worked um, you know, in kind of an audit related field. And, and this was kind of a, completely different experience. Um, and it was very interesting because there's a number of ways that I really developed. I was in the role about two and a half years. And when I you know, finished and I look at how the ways that I think now versus how I thought before, I, I've really changed um, and in a positive way. And it's really developed me in so many ways. Um, one thing that it was super um, helpful, and, and this is a big hump or it was a big hump for me to get over, to innovate or innovation really in a lot of ways is acknowledging that whatever we're doing now is not the most effective way. And so at the beginning, when I started to kind of get into this role and think about innovating, it felt like we're constantly saying that we're doing a bad job, right? Or this is not good the way we're doing it now. That's why we have to innovate because there's a lot of conversation and innovation around being agile, around iterating. Um, and so at the beginning, that felt a lot to me, like almost like, well, there are gaps today. It's probably the audit mindset. Well, that means there's gaps today. There's problems today. There's inefficiencies today. And so we're constantly talking about how things are bad. And it took quite a while for me to kind of um, shift that thinking, I guess, into, no, we're not reflecting on it as it wasn't good before. We're actually just trying to make things better and better and better. And that's a positive thing. So we don't want to, we don't want to constantly be looking at it and saying, this is a failure, this is a, or this is bad, right? We actually want to embrace failure and we want to think about, you know, we've got something, we're going to make it better, we're going to make it better. Um, so that was really, that was a big one. And I think, you know, it, it just really helps me now today to think about, okay, how can we do something better without thinking about or kind of talking about, okay, whose fault is it that it wasn't good before or just the ways maybe that you're thinking, um, I was thinking beforehand. Um, so over, over time, I was able to shift that mindset. Uh, beside Agile, I learned a lot of different other techniques like prototyping or, or piloting things. So just try something in a small way before you kind of overhaul stuff. And then maybe it didn't work out the way that you wanted. So I really, all of those things I constantly employ almost in my day-to-day day-to-day -day thinking is just like, if, you know, there's something we want to try. It's like, well, how do we try that just a little bit? How do we try that over here? And then how do we evaluate that pilot and iterate on it, right? Whether it's, it, it could be anything. It's not, it's not tech uh, just, it's kind of any process or change to the way we're behaving. Um, and if it doesn't work, you know, if it's, we pilot it and it don't, doesn't look good, we either iterate that a little bit or it's, we scrap it. 
Um, you know, we talk about, you know, number one, fail fast and move on, right? So something doesn't work, scrap it and move on. Don't, you know, don't continue to, to deal with something that, you know, is, is not good. Um, you want to create a lot of ideas, but you don't want to get married to them because the minute you attach yourself and invest yourself in one specific change or idea so much, then you're constantly trying to make it successful, even if it's really not meant to be or really not successful. Um, so you got to, you know, those are all kind of learned mindsets and behaviors for me that, you know, I embraced over that time and really have helped me and helped me now and everything that I do. Um, and then I have like on the side, remember that there's those potholes, there's those failures, you know, you learn from failure and you, but you need to move on. The more you try to make something that's really failing, continue to succeed when it's, there's other things that you got to move on and create new ideas. Um, and I think a lot about, you know, when, you know, talk about pivoting when, you know, COVID hit and we all kind of had to go fully remote immediately um, in this program, this innovation program, I was running like a, we have three innovation sites. I was running a fully seconded program where everyone was physically in these locations, like every day working together and then had to kind of change on a dime to how, how can we be effective all individually separately? Um, and so you just, you just, sometimes you're forced to change. Sometimes you kind of think about change, but try to embrace it. Um, try not to worry too much about why things didn't work before. It's about getting better and constant improvement. Um, and I think that having this type of mindset about improvement and iterating and pivoting quickly, this is something that you wanna instill in your teams as well, this type of mindset. So to me, when I can employ these kind of behaviors and create ideas and share those with my team and talk through them, uh, because these things get refined the best when multiple people have a voice, those things then feed off onto the people that are working with me. And so all of that kind of promotes kind of really good, creative, diverse thought, which is really the best. So, um, so innovation is another key one for me. Um, so the next one is listening and, and empathy, which really is honestly some honing this capability is really important and has been kind of foundational for me in connecting with people and understanding them. Um, and obviously in recent years, there's been a heightened, heightened focus on empathy uh, and listening to others, but it really also, I guess, from just to kind of translate it to into business speak, it's when you can really empathize with somebody, you create a strong relationship and investment between each other. And that's, you know, that's obviously something very strong in business is when you can create that type of relationship with people and be kind of jointly invested in each other. Um, and I wanted to play a little funny clip for you about listening and empathy that I thought you might enjoy. Um, let me know if the sound is not coming through. It's just, there's all this pressure, you know? And sometimes it feels like it's right up on me and I can just feel it, like literally feel it in my head and it's relentless. And I don't know if it's gonna stop. I mean, that's the thing that scares me the most is that I don't know if it's ever gonna stop. Yeah. But you do have a nail in your head. It is not about the nail. Are you sure? Because I mean, I'll bet if we got that out of there. Stop it, trying to fix it. No, I'm not trying to fix it. I'm just pointing out that maybe the nail is causing- You always do this. You always try to fix things when what I really need is for you to just listen. See, I don't think that is what you need. I think what you need is to get the nail- See, out. you're not even listening now. Okay, fine. I will listen, fine. It's just, sometimes it's like, there's this achy, I don't know what it is. And I'm not sleeping very well at all. And all my sweaters are snagged. I mean, all of them. I, that sounds really hard. It is. Thank you. Ow! Oh, come on. Ow. If you would just don't try to see things my way. Okay, so hopefully you all enjoyed that um, little anecdote, which I like to use that one a lot when I talk about listening uh, and empathy. Um, it's kind of a fun one. Uh, but I mean, really kind of some of the things that I think about all the time when I'm talking with folks and trying to understand the perspective is you don't need to always come in thinking that you have the solution for things. 
um, or you have the answer and, and maybe you do and maybe you don't, but maybe the person that you're talking to, that's not what they're looking for. And so we have to kind of temper ourselves and really spend that time to listen and concern ourselves with how other people feel. That's what empathy is really about. Um, and again, you know, these kinds of situations where you can empathize with somebody, um, you really build a connection, a strong bond. They become invested in you and your success as well, and you're invested in them. Uh, and that really, I mean, that's an amazing thing. Um, you know, I, I always try to in, kind of take a pause and I'm a, I like to talk and I'm a big talker as well. Um, and it's kind of like, we really have to kind of stop and listen and then really understand how somebody's feeling. And so that's really a critical place to connect with people, RP, you know, in all levels around us. So this is Joe Cocker and my father raised me on classic rock music. Um, and I was always fascinated with his rendition at Woodstock of I get by with a little help from my friends because of uh, it's, you know, he's clearly going through almost a religious moment when he's performing. Um, and so when I think about that song, I, I actually don't think about the Beatles. I think about him first. Um, so I wanted to share him with you. Relationships are probably one of the most important things um, in my career and um, probably the most important thing in my career. And I've, you know, been building relationships my entire career. I would say to you that earlier in my career, I was not purposeful about it. Um, it just happens. And maybe that, you know, you've all, maybe you've all experienced that kind of as you're earlier in your career, there are relationships forming, there's networking happening. And some of it is like happenstance. And then as you kind of start to understand the power of relationships, you really can be more purpose, purposeful about where you invest your time. Um, to me, relationships make work enjoyable. Um, it's a support system when you need it. You can get new ideas, you get advice. It's just, it serves so many purposes um, that are really important. Uh, and if you remember the story I told you about how kind of, I was already telling myself I couldn't do this in innovation role uh, before I was doing it. In kind of those days of panic between when I was told I was getting it and, and when I actually took the role on. Uh, and specifically, you know, the weeks, right after I heard, I wasn't supposed to share that with anybody, but I called like my closest coworker and said, you know, cause I was in such, I was kind of making myself a little nuts. And I said, you know, I just heard I got this role and I'm like freaking out because I have no idea what I'm, I have no idea how to do what I'm gonna be doing. And this person who I completely trust said to me, you are gonna make the program look good and you're gonna make the leadership look good. And having somebody that I trusted that much be able to tell me how confident I should be and show me how confident he was settled my settled me down quite a bit because again probably even more so than kind of having the faith in leadership now you're talking about somebody that really knew me super well and kind of knew my capabilities as well super well but kind of from outside of me was really telling me that it just gave me the courage and the confidence like in a way that nothing else could um, so trusted relationships to me are like super invaluable. They become lifelong friends, clients, you know, they help you con connect you with job prospects when you need them. They give you advice. There there's so many things that, that really good relationships do for you. Um, they also help you have influence on things that are happening around you. And as you think about kind of the leadership spectrum that Chad was talking about, and as you're growing and, and you have more teams under you or organizational pieces under you, you're going to need friends in the field. You're going to need friends in different areas of the world. You're going to need friends at different levels uh, in different capability or business unit areas that when you have to try to achieve an initiative or get a program of work done, people you can call and say, you know, number one, you can say, hey, I'm trying to do this. Um, so I want you to share this with your teams. But honestly, too, a great tactic is, hey, it's really important for me personally that this is successful. These are the kinds of things I think I'm gonna need. Is there anything you can do to help me, right? And when you've built those longstanding trusted relationships with people, they're gonna do what they can to help you. You know, one, just for, from a business perspective, but two, if you've built that kind of that empathy and trust, then they're honestly just gonna say, you know, if I can help Barbie right now, I'm gonna help her. So if she said she needs this or that, let me see what I can do to shake some trees and make it happen. So it's just really been so instrumental to my success. 
Um, and it's really, you know, something maybe that, you know, especially early in our career, we take for granted, but it's not to be taken for granted. And it's been amazing uh, to me. So one more trait I wanted to talk about, it's like probably a little more, um, you know, more late breaking, I'll call it, or we, we I don't think we have talked like this uh, forever. But I learned also um, really when I was in the innovation role about the power of storytelling. Um, and more and more, this is kind of infiltrating a lot of the business activities that are happening. And, and many of you may be familiar with this, some maybe not, but it's really the concept that we're always delivering information, right? We're delivering reports, we're delivering data, we're delivering information. But if we really wanna influence people and Chad was talking about influencing people, we need to inspire them, right? And we need to kind of connect with their emotions, you know, and have that number one, they need to consume what we're saying, but more so if we wanna incite action or create a call to action that's effective with people, we need to captivate the audience and inspire the audience. And so the kind of the, the power of storytelling, so delivering information in a different way, you're still delivering the same, I'll call it data points or facts, but in a completely different way that really incites people to act or think a certain way or kind of whatever whatever you're kind of looking for uh, out of that. And I'll tell you a little story here. And so I've, I've been embracing this tactic for a few years and honestly, it's it's you know powerful for a number of reasons and I enjoy it. So I, I look for opportunities to do it. Um, and last year I was fortunate to be one of the people that Consulting Magazine awarded um, like a top consultant for 2022. Um, and there's like 25 or 30 of those each year. And then there's a big kind of awards dinner and, and everybody, you know, all the award winners get to speak. And I remember kind of thinking about, you know, what was I going to say when I was trying to plan for that? And of course, like normal stuff comes to your head. Like I should like thank my husband and my coworkers. I should thank my clients and I should, you know, tell people about how great it's been. And, um, and it's funny because I was like the second to last person to speak. And when I did hear everybody speak for the most part, that's what they were talking about and or how, um, you know, causes that are important to them like DEI or ESG. So, you know, it was a lot of the stuff I guess that I had contemplated when I was thinking about what to say. But I guess as I was thinking about what to say in like the days that preceded, I was saying to myself, you know, there's like a lot of people that are gonna be speaking and I'm sure everybody's gonna have a bit of that tone and theme. And I think I need to do some of that as well, but wouldn't it be enjoyable for the audience and interesting? And by the way, the category that I won in was innovation. Um, wouldn't it be interesting for me to story tell in my award speech? Um, and so that's what I decided to do. So I actually um, said, I was kind of telling people essentially that, you know, winning this award had helped me reflect on kind of where I've come from and discussed how you know, my mother always you know, encouraged me to focus on my education and my degree and to go, you know, go into kind of the, the business world. Um, and so I followed kind of what she had been teaching me, but that my father had a very different aspiration for me because he wanted me to be a drummer in a rock band. And then I kind of went on to discuss that a little more and talk about also what my life would have been like if I had been a drummer in a rock band instead of like a career internal auditor essentially. Um, and it was just, I think the audience was surprised. There was an element of surprise to it. There was a lot of laughs. Um, and, you know, after the session, I had people coming up to me telling me like, what a great story that was, or that they played the drums when they were kids or just a numerous amounts of things. So number one, I, you know, I grew my network just through that story. And two, I kind of made an impact on people. Um, and I made new contacts and, when you can entertain a group of people, not to mention there's just something innately re rewarding when you have kind of an audience laughing and, and enjoying kind of what you're saying. Um, and that's just one example, but I think that, you know, as a leader, you're gonna run into many situations where you can influence people, you, you can disseminate a message and it's not just the what, it's the how. How are you gonna deliver that message in a way where you're really inciting action or inspiring people to act, creating an inspiration for people? Um, so that's really something I think about all the time now when I'm asked to kind of present somewhere or, or um, you know, send a message to folks or communicate something is, is how do I, how do I better like story tell this message so that it's impactful to people? So um, my journey is continuing. I actually wrapped up the innovation role at the end of 2021. 
And starting this year, I have, as Fareed mentioned, I'm now the Global Strategic Account Management Program Leader, which is really just the largest accounts at Pertivity. I kind of run the program of like how we handle those and what we do. And what's very interesting is, you know, you take the tools that you learned before and you bring them with you. And so what I am finding is that in this role, I'm bringing a lot of innovation, like the way I think about what we can do or should do or how to pilot things or try things um, is just probably so different that if I uh, didn't have the innovation role before. And so you're continuing to add to your toolbox around how to think differently, how to lead differently, um, how to innovate, create new things. So I'm doing that. Um, I'm doing that now. I'm excited for this, this new journey. I'm just a few months into, and uh, you know, I don't know what's after that or, you know, how long that'll be, but you know, for now I'm kind of want to just embrace it and really make an impact there. Uh, so just to conclude, you know, everybody's journey is unique and just embrace your journey, take risks. Don't be afraid to fail. Sometimes you'll learn a lot from all the new adventures that you have. Um, look for ways to innovate and try new things and other people will learn from your mindset in doing that. Listen and empathize with those around you and embrace and adopt um, their strengths as well and build relationships along your path. Deepen them over time. They'll be there for you when you really need them and be a storyteller. It will give you the power to captivate and influence people. Thank you. Thank you so much, Barbie. That was amazing. And I love that that video. I think it really does capture it, you know, for empathy and listening. You know, it really isn't about the nail, you know. So I think that was just amazing. Um, I know and one, one one quick thing, Tina, I was gonna say, and, and I apologize for missing this earlier. Not everyone gets the consulting magazine award. So I'll be very clear about it. And only one person got the Global Innovation Leader Award, Barbie. So I know you don't like to put yourself up, but you deserve it. Thanks, Thank Rick. you. Thank you. Very cool. So now we're going to um, ask a bunch of questions. So one of the things I would say for the audience is that you can use the chat to ask us any additional questions. Um, but we're going to have Barbie, myself, and Chad um, answering some questions about um, the journey in leadership. Um, one of the things I, I think that's a good one is, um, and I think you touched upon it um, a little bit, is what is your biggest regret in your leadership journey? And I'll start with you, Barbie. Sure. It, I mean, hard to say, I guess. With a, I feel lucky that I don't kind of live every day going, I wish I would have done this because I don't. Um, you know, and learning to take risks has helped me. Um, and I would say probably just most, I mean, that's probably specific to everybody, but for me, the one thing I always wonder about is I've actually never been on the industry side. I've always been in consulting. And so, and there were moments in my career where I kind of said, maybe I should kind of try that and just develop in that way, but I never did. So that's the one where I always say, oh, maybe that would have been like developmentally helpful for me. Um, you know, but I'm definitely happy with the path that I've had and, and, and the ways I've been able to develop. Very cool. Chad, do you have anything yeah. to add? Yeah, you know, Tina, I, I wish if this was 20 years ago, right? Because that's where I started. If this was 20 years ago. What I would have said to myself is, Chad, your, your failures, and I've shared my failures publicly for, with many, but your failures are what helped you become successful. And I wouldn't have covered them up. I would have been more vulnerable and I would have shared. Because I think when you're a young leader, you think you need to be perfect. And what people want is real and they want hard work and they want good character. I, I covered up my failures in the beginning because I thought it made me look weak. And what I realize now is if you're really truly, uh, if you share what you've been through, it actually shows a level of, uh, a level of strength as a leader. And I would, I would have liked to have done that sooner. Yeah. Yeah, that's, I think that's great. It's a sign of maturity and people just really don't know that that really is something that's a learning, a learning step. So I think that's really cool. Yeah. I, I'm going to say similar to, to Barbie. I wish I had taken those risks. You know, I was very comfortable in my journey of development and it was just like, okay, I'm just going to keep on, keep on chugging away where I'm at. Mm -hmm. And I saw so many different opportunities that 
would have changed my way of thinking and given me a different outlook. And I think like, you know, especially when you're thinking, when you said about innovation and your way of thinking and having more um, perception of what everything is out there, when you take those other risks and you look at things from different perspectives, it does help you in your, in your leadership journey. And like you said, um, Chad, it's your competencies and having that different perspectives increases their competencies and then your consistency with doing it. So I think that's amazing. Uh, we got awesome. some questions from, from, um, from the, the um, attendees. One of them is, how do I lead if I'm not in a management position, not a defined leader? So Chad, I'll give that to you first. Yeah, so we, we actually spoke about this in the board meeting uh, where we did the training with the board. I, I think it's important that we don't confuse leader with position. You see, if, if, we, if we think we need a title to be able to influence, then that becomes a very difficult thing because then you say, well, I can't, I can't, I can't move it forward if I, if I don't have that title. I, I, and I mentioned this one in the board meeting. Uh, I'm a leader and it doesn't matter what room I go into. I respect the people. I value the people. I, I really want to add value to the people. But the thing I know is this, is that I can influence people because I want to figure out what they value and I want to figure out how to add value. So if you're in an organization and you don't have the title, it doesn't mean you can't influence. It just means that you need to understand what they value and then how could you add value? Because influence is a 360. You don't, you don't just influence top down. You could influence bottom up. You could influence left, left to right, peer to peer. So I think a lot of leaders or a lot of people that are in business think that you could only influence if you have the title. That's only one way of influence. And it's actually the least impactful because they'll only follow you because they have to, not because they want to. Yeah, I think that's a good one. You know, we were having a conversation, Barbie, myself, and Fareed, when we were talking about this. And Fareed actually took a snapshot of someone reading a book. And I thought that was amazing. I was like, you know, I'm going to actually put this somewhere because um, I thought it was an amazing picture. It was a young man that was like sitting in like his little like, construction worker outfit. And he's like, how to be a leader when you're not in charge, right? And I was like, you know, always thinking of how you can use influence. And I thought that that was like amazing. And I wanted to make a poster board of it and bring it to my <laughs> next um staff meeting that we have because everybody can influence and can be a leader so yeah. I think, thank you chad that's a good one um My another pleasure. question we have from jack um he says your career journey is amazing did you know you were going to be um getting the managing director how did the organization see the innovation side of you when you didn't see it and i think that's for you barbie yeah sure thanks jack um, did I know for sure that I would get where I am? Like, I, of course I wasn't sure, but I think I always aspired. Right. So I was pretty driven and ambitious. And I think that that's important, right. Always trying to kind of do more and take on more responsibility. So kind of doing your, your piece at any level of kind of demonstrating that you're hungry, mm. right. And you want to do more. Um, so, you know, I was happy to kind of be, you know, be able to, to reach this level for sure. Um, the innovation question is interesting. How did they know? Um, you know, it's funny that, and, and I don't know, you know, every institution I'm sure is different. At, I think at uh, where I am at Pertivity, they, they tend to look for honestly leadership traits, I believe. And then they kind of put you in places where you're uncomfortable and they try to see how you do there. Um, and so I think a little bit of it was them seeing some skills in me or things in me, not innovation maybe, um, and one of the things that when I really was kind of at a point of like, I don't understand why you're considering me for this, like early on before I interviewed, I kind of gently asked like how, you know, why, you know, I, I guess I expressed some of my fears about like not being some kind of emerging tech um, guru. And one of the leaders says to me, you know, I can hire that. He said, I can hire that. What I can't hire is somebody that can influence the, t the organization globally. And you have a ton of relationships here across the globe. And I need somebody that can influence and change the organization. We need to shift mindset more toward innovation. And so I, re I realized that I need somebody who can do that. And that's somebody internal like you, essentially. 
Um, and so they actually weren't kind of um, seeing necessarily innovation in me. They were seeing other leadership skills, probably as Chad would say. And then I think mm -hmm. hopefully seeing enough of, we've put her in a lot of different situations and she's managed to adapt. So she, she'll likely do that here as well with, from a content perspective, I would say, cause you still, you need to kind of glom onto that. Um, and so that's kind of, I think why I got the opportunity I got. Um, but I'll tell you kind of, and just to Tina's points, how I, if you would have asked me on day one, is this going to change me the way it's changed me? I would have said, I don't know how anything could I've already been, you know, working for 20 years or whatever it is. But when I look back, it's like, wow, I think so differently. So you almost can't see the volume to which you could develop. You have to just kind of understand, okay, is this something I could take on that could do new things for me? And I won't know exactly how I'll be at the end, but, um, that was like a priceless opportunity for me and definitely has developed me in yeah. so many ways. Yeah. C can I add to that for a second, Tina? Sure. I, I, I think it's so important, Barbie, because what, you, what you've done in your journey is you, you said yes. And, and, and when you say yes, people can work with yes. I, I think a lot of leaders, what they do is they need to see every part of the journey. They need to see every part of the steps. And that's a very that that's someone that's not pliable. That's someone that that they they they're very stringent, right? And 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 you know, le leadership is not like this. It's not leadership. You have to be very fluid and navigate around things. And I think when you keep saying yes, opportunities keep getting bigger. And 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 and, and that's what I would say. The people on today is you don't need to know every step of the journey. You just need to start walking. And it's something that I struggled with for many years. And then when I realized it, that I didn't need to see the whole entire journey. I just needed to start walking. Opportunities got bigger. Life got more enjoyable. And my gifts and talents were able to be recognized better because I just said yes. And Barbie, you, you've done that your whole journey. I, I, as I was listening to you go through it, it was just a life of yes, 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 yes. I don't know it all, but I'll do it and I'll figure it out. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, the next question we have is, what is one thing you wish you knew in the earlier stages of your professional career? Um, I'll start off. I wish that I um, knew that the relationships that I was building was going to sustain me through this, this whole thing. You know, I... I this, what you said about relationships and getting you to the next level, using it for influence, being there to encourage you. I will say that that was one of the things that I wish that I had learned at the beginning. That all the people that I had was like, you know, when you think about Dora the Explorer and she had her backpack and she was filling that backpack <laughs> with everything that she needed. I was, I, I think, about all the people that I could have kept and kept my relationships going and I now I reach back out to them and I'm like trying to rekindle those relationships because I know that they are in my backpack and helping me and propelling me forward and like you had on that screen onwards and upwards I think you know that those relationships have helped me grow and so I, you know that's one of the things that I you know I wish yeah. I had in my earlier career that um, was the first thing that came to my mind with this question too was like if I would have understood that sooner right, or earlier, right, how important that is and being more purposeful about it. That's always like the earlier you start to do that, the better off, no question. Mm -hmm. uh, and we try to teach yeah. that, you know, all the way down from our kind of staff level. We, we talk about relationships and networking and deepening and investing in relationships, building trust, because it's like the earlier you do it, the more rich your kind of community will be that's around you, for sure. Yeah. You know, Barbie, as you're sharing that, and Tina, as you're sharing that, I'm thinking of the, the phrase, your network becomes your net worth, yeah. right? Uh, a lot of people think that, that you know, they're going to just work their way through. Uh, today, Earlier today, my wife and I, we have a not-for-profit organization. So at 7 a.m., I'm, in, in, I'm actually in my alma mater co uh, high school that I went to, and I'm speaking to 600 students, right? By the end of today, our organization will have spoke to 3,000 students. And the one of the things that, that, that I shared with them is, is that our choices that we make make us. Right. And a lot of the times when we're thinking of our relationships, we make choices around like what's short term, what's best for Chad now or Barbie now. 
but but really how do you manage relationships and and, and today just just literally I, it was my basketball coach from high school he said chad we need to stay connected he goes give me your cell phone number the relationship that would open up doors you don't know where they go and 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 just wanting to add value to people and then seeing where that takes it. And I, and I've seen that I've seen, I actually have seen that all across the whole ISOC and network. You guys are great at doing that. Very cool. Yeah, that's a good yeah. one. Um, the next question we have is how do you lead in a role when you don't feel comfortable in your own skin? For example, you mentioned getting into a new role. Did you feel comfortable leading? That's, that's a great question. Um, and I would say that you have to get used to being uncomfortable because you're never fully ready. You know what I was like, just thinking about uh, chatting with you guys today, <laughs> I thought about how, for those of you that are parents, like when you're going to have your first kid, like you're never ready or you go to yourself, I'm not ready for this. Right. But you are ready and you handle it when it comes. Right. So it's a little bit like, you're never going to be comfortable. You, there's going to be a level of discomfort, a level of fear, a level of anxiety that comes along with, I don't, to Chad's point, I don't know exactly how this is going to be. I don't know exactly how it's going to go. I don't know exactly what's going to happen. Yeah. Um, do I don't know exactly how I'm going to figure something out, some challenge. So you have to kind of just start to get comfortable being uncomfortable and get familiar with that, but have enough courage and confidence to say, yeah, I don't know exactly how I'm going to tackle this right now but I'll figure it out, right? I know I'll figure it out. I have, you know, to the points we were making earlier, I have a group of people around me that will help me, right? Everybody wants me to succeed here. It's not, no one's running around sabotage. Like I have, I have a support system and I have teams that work for me and I have trusted relationships and I have knowledge about certain things. I'll be able to get through this and figure it out and hopefully make it better. And so you just got, you got to have the courage to be uncomfortable and get through it. Um, and you know, that works out very well. You just, at the beginning, sometimes you get, you let kind of that fear set in too much and you, you scare yourself and you got to try to do your yeah. best to kind of put that aside. Chad, I'm sure you could share more yeah. on this too. Yeah, no, you, you hit it. My wife and I, many years ago, we had a coach. I mean, we, we've, we've been in this space for years, hiring coaches, working with organizations, but we had a coach that gave us this acronym, Barbie, to what you just said, fear. And it's a really powerful acronym. He said, false evidence appearing real. False evidence appearing real. Because most people have fear, fear of the unknown, fear of what people may say. Most of the fear that we have, studies have shown that 98% of the fears that we have actually never even happen. So to, to your point, Barbie, is that when you have fear, it's, re it's natural, it's a human emotion, but how do we take that fear and harness it so that we can move forward? And you've done that throughout your career. And I think as a leader, if we're going to get into a position where we're not confident in ourselves, it's okay. There's many, there's many boardrooms that I sit in that I'm not the smartest person in the room. I'm not the most confident person in the room. But I do know that my job is choosing love over fear. And, and, and we use the acronym love as leaving others valuable experiences. So love over fear will always make you greater and more valuable in the marketplace. Yeah, that's good. I like that. I'm like, I like fear and I like the love acronym. <laughs> it's, definitely <useful. laughs> it, it's been a game changer for us. And we learned it 10 years ago and we've used it. You can't even imagine how many times. <laughs> yeah. Um, the next question we had is, Chad, thank you for aligning with the ISACA New York Metropolitan Chapter. Um, it is interesting. My pleasure. <laughs> more um, than training and certifications. Is there a leadership certification in this in the industry? There, there is. Uh, there, there's one in particular, uh, and you had mentioned, Fareed had mentioned it earlier, John Maxwell, he has a leadership certification. Uh, it, it, it's, it's to develop people to be leaders and to be coaches and stuff like that. So I, I would look at that uh, we will eventually, as our as our company continues to grow, we're going to be creating a certification program as well to certify people in leadership development. But yeah, so 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 John Maxwell has one right now. I would recommend that. In about a year or two, we will be launching ours as well. So those are the two. Yeah, we'll come back and see you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the next one is um, this is from Jay, um, Jason. He's like, what do you, what 
do you do in your personal time that helps you be a leader? Great question. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's a couple of things that come to mind for me. Um, and I would just say also, I'm probably not purposeful enough with that or making that tie together between my personal life and my work life. Although that's starting to be something that develops for me. Um, so one, I actually sit on the audit committee of my school district, which is a public school district. Um, and I, it, from my perspective, it kind of has me on the other side of the table from kind of what I do on a day-to-day basis. Uh, so it's interesting being in that situation and also in a place where, you know, I have my kids are in that school and so on. And so um, I've enjoyed that. I've actually been on that audit committee probably for maybe 15 years now. Uh, and I do like that. And I, you know, add the value of our industry to kind of what's happening in the community. And the other thing that um, probably a little more recent of a development for me is I'm, I'm kind of getting more involved in the, in the philanthropic areas too. And so how can I influence the community uh, and help the community? And then how can I tie that back to kind of my development and business and so on? And so that's something I'm kind of exploring right now too. Yeah. Yeah. I'll say for me, I'm a Girl Scout Chief Leader. And so I, I'm a chief leader for girls that are in high school. And for me, that is seeing the future and seeing their growth actually helps me when I'm doing like the listening that you're saying and understanding how young minds are, are, are forming these days. It helps me also with my own growth, but it's always rewarding yeah. to see their growth. And it helps me when I'm talking to staff and that I've seen this and I've seen it with young minds and what they're trying to achieve in the world and their drive and trying to keep them motivated. So some mm. of those motivations I use for the, um, my staff as well. So that's one for me. Yeah, that's good. You know, uh, we, we, I, I do two things. I, I have a power hour in the morning and I have a debrief at night. And I do that every day, Monday through Friday. Power hour in the morning, debrief at night. The power hour sometimes could just be 20 minutes. It's not an hour. Sometimes it's two hours. It depends what my calendar looks like. But but what I do in that is it's a book that I want to read that's empowering to me. It's a affirmation statement that I'll listen to today. I, I was on my way to the school, the school that I was speaking at, and I'm listening to it because I can't read while I'm in the car. Uh, I'm a person of faith, so I'll read the word of God. Uh, but wherever you are, it's, it's something that motivates you and fills your cup. So I do that in the morning, and every night I debrief. I go over my calendar. I go, what was my lesson learned from that day? Um, who did I add value to that day? What am I grateful for that day? And I do that every day, Monday through Friday for the last 12 years. It is a game changer because it takes something, you know, I had a mentor many years ago that says a lot of people have uphill uphill dreams with downhill habits and it takes uphill dreams and now it aligns your uphill habits and it allows, it it just, it, 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 it just gives you opportunities you wouldn't have had by reflecting at night and preparing in the morning. That's amazing. Um, that's cool. The next question we have is from Todd. He said, what advice do you have for a technology risk journeyman that's considering transitioning to consulting? Barbie? Sure. So I guess the one, um, it's probably goes back a bit to kind of taking risks, but I think, um, and it depends really what your background is, obviously, and some of the details around what you're thinking about. I think if you kind of go, um, and change kind of into a consulting firm where the roles are a little less defined. Um, You may be given opportunities to work in different content subject matter or with different types of industry groups or or everything, uh, depending where the demand sits. And so just embrace those, right? And look at that as a development opportunity, especially if most of your career has been in kind of a one competency space, you'll probably really kind of round yourself out with a lot of other foundational things that, you know, help you think differently about the pieces that you already are strong in. Mm. Um, I'll just go to the next question because we do have a lot of questions here. Um, What resources do you suggest for new leaders, books, podcasts, um, apps, et cetera? Or Barbie? Yeah, I'll just take that one first. Yeah, one book that I love is The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. 
So I don't know if, yeah. if you haven't read that one before. Um, to me, it talks a lot about these relationships and trust and just a bunch of things that help a team be cohesive or not. And I just think it's those concepts are very good to know as a leader. So when you're trying to create cohesive teams and environments that are well high functioning, um, to me, it's, it really resonated for me. Yeah. You know, Barbie, uh, Fareed and I in October were just with Patrick in Atlanta. Last October, he was talking about uh, his new book. Um, so, but phenomenal book. I agree with you. Uh, I, I would say the 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership uh, by John Maxwell is a phenomenal leadership development tool because it tells you the 21 laws that every leader needs to be aware of and not every leader is going to be good at. And then secondly, um, from a continuum of development, I love what we're doing with you guys over at ISACA because we actually created a whole leadership uh, development training that's going to be launched in the next, uh, Tina, I'm not sure the exact day, but in the next week, a couple of weeks, we're going to be launching it out to the whole entire chapter and then globally on how to get continuing education and develop yourself as a leader. So that's really exciting. So I would say the 21 laws and the training that you guys are doing through uh, ISACA with partnership with our, with our company. And, and Chad, that will be a, a certificate that's provided uh, between Lions Pride Leadership and the ISACA New York chapter. So it's something that they'll be proud of, of having, it's something that can be referenced on, on the resume for sure. Yep, absolutely. Very cool. Um, another question we have is, um, what are the best ways that leaders can support other leaders? Hmm. So Barbie? So, I would definitely say, from my perspective, you need to be invested in each other, right? And whether that's your peers, uh, but the, kind of the conversations that I was talking about around empathy and relationships, honestly, some of it is just having a personal investment in somebody else. So we all have initiatives we're trying to drive or teams we're leading or programs of work or whatever it is. And when someone says, hey, I, I could use some help, right? Or I'm, I'm trying to achieve something, can you do anything to support them? And again, like 90% of the time, you're, that's going to be reciprocated. You're building a stronger bond with that person and trust with that person. And so each of you is going to be able to be stronger because you're going to know you have each other to rely on. Do you need to borrow someone from someone else's team? Do you need a piece um, of expertise that somebody else has access to? You know, creating those bonds, they help you and you help them. And a lot of times that can be the difference of being able to be successful with something you're trying to drive. And so having that support around you. Um, so invest in others, I guess, is the key because that that becomes reciprocated. You want to be somebody that people know they can count on. And then when you have an ask, when you need something, you'll be able to count on them, basically. Hey, I know we're running towards the end of the hour here. So if you want to, Mike and Jemmy left a, a questionnaire. If you want to hit that, he's a prior Wasserman Award winner and global president, uh, Barbie, as well as chapter president. Uh, so Tina, the question is great to hear these experiences and you guys hopefully can give one last thought on this and then hopefully Chad, you can take us the rest of the way. Uh, great to hear these experiences and growth among the ISACA members. How do you manage inform information overload? And, and this is something we all see, just curious to see <laughs> as Michael, what, where you guys This is good. From. This is a good question. Uh, can, can I feel that one guys? Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. So, so one of the things, Fareed, that I, that, I had, that I did in the beginning of my career is I read a book a week. I did that for 12 years. So I read 600 books. And what I felt was so overwhelmed because it was like, inf like you know, similar to what Michael has said, uh, information overload. So what I've done is I, I, I've taken uh, every area and I broke it down into five things. I call it fishes, F-I-S-H-S. So when I'm looking at stuff, I said, okay, is this helping me grow financially? Is this helping me grow intellectually? Is this helping me grow socially, similar to like Barbie building your social capital? Is this helping me grow human capital? Or is this helping me grow my spiritual capital? So when I'm reading something, I'm able to say, okay, which one of those five does it apply to? Because then if not, I just get totally overwhelmed because, you know, too much information and not know what to do with it. It's not actually beneficial. It actually can, can stifle your growth. 
but I'm able to process it through those five, that lens of fishes, financial, intellectual, social, human, and spiritual. And then I say, okay, well, how does this work in my business life and my personal life? So that, that's just how I process data. And uh, I'll take a next step at it. You know, I too, I, I didn't have a methodology, like a, a, an acronym of what I'm going through, but when thinking about different things and absorbing different information. You know, one of the things that I like that every time we have a meeting with you, Chad, is that you always say, what is that takeaway? What is that one thing mm. that you need to take away from this, this event, whatever the meeting is? And that is something that I think that we all should do. Every time you do something, every time you hear something, you should take that one thing that you have and make that your, your champion for, the, for whatever that meeting was and use it, put it in a poster, start actually incorporating it into your daily life so that it actually maintains and you sustain it. Because otherwise it's uh, just all this information is coming in and you can't absorb it. It's just, it's impossible. So, you know, that's yeah. one of the things that I think that's a good help. Barbie, I'll let you do the last word. Yeah, I'm kind of taking the other side. Um, I actually think about delivering information and how do we get people to consume it? And that's where kind of that storytelling philosophy comes into play because mm -hmm. there is, everything is fighting for our attention all the time, right? All the information we get. Um, and if, if we wanna be leaders that can influence people, right? And inspire people, how do we, how do we kind of, you know, in, how do we get them to want to consume what it is that we're trying to send the messages we're sending? Cause there's all those other messages coming through at the same time. And so kind of creating that different type of environment to deliver the information, I found it to be really effective in making sure that important, the important messages are getting through to people. Yeah. So thank That's you. All. Thank you all for attending. We had over like 120 um, participants. So thank you all for coming mm -hmm. in and hearing all this insight and this great information. And hopefully you're absorbing some of the things that we said here and it wasn't overwhelming for you. Um, we have one more, um, one more leadership principle to discuss in the series. And um, that one is on motivation. Motivation, yes, sorry. So motivation, uh, hopefully we'll have that for you shortly. And um, we have an event this evening um, for She Leads Tech. So if you haven't, please go onto our website and log in. I think Sam, can you put in the event link so that into the chat so if anyone wants to uh sign up for this evening's event uh please do so um, and just to let you guys know for all of you who put your name in um with the the questions for today we will be sending you um something from lion's pride it's one of their continuous uh leadership uh what do you say blogs and and um Stuff. Chad, can you give us more information? Yeah, about yeah. We we have a, a monthly mentoring that uh, Isaka has uh, uh, purchased to invest in people in their membership, Th those that are asking questions and really actively engaged. So those are some of the things that uh, they they'll be sending you access to it. It's a it's a once a month live call where I do a teaching, and then we do an open Q and A. And it's every month on a different leadership topic. So that's what Tina was kind of alluding to. And I, I just want to thank you guys because I think what I think what you guys are doing at ISAC is phenomenal. And when you take you know technical and then you bring this leadership element to it, it just it, it changes the game. So I, I, I applaud all of you. And 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 Barbie, I love your story. I I I I'm walking away saying Barbie lives a life of yes. That's my that's my takeaway. <laughs> Very cool. Thank you all. And have a good afternoon. Farid, do you want to say anything? No, we're all set. Thank you, guys. Thanks for, thanks for attending. Thank yeah. you, Barbie. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Have a good day. Be well. Have a good one. Bye.